My name is Nicole Netherton, and I'm the Executive Director of Travis Audubon. I'm very glad you've chosen to join us tonight. If you are a member of Travis Audubon, thank you so much for your continued support. If you're not yet a member, I invite you to join us. You can go to our membership page on our website, travisaudubon.org. Just a couple of quick announcements this evening. Uh, we are planning an in-person holiday gathering at Blair Woods on Saturday, December 4th, that afternoon from noon to four. We have some really fun things planned, a barn sale full of great treats and discounted merchandise. We have some themed walks on the hour that you are welcome to join and learn more about the site and a trail uh, scavenger hunt with a holiday theme that is great for kids of all ages. It's come and go, it's mostly outdoors. We would love to see you, um, so please join us. You can learn more information on our website and we'll actually drop that webpage into our chat for you to learn more. And just to note that we are hopeful that in 2022, we'll be able to return to some in-person meetings. We plan to send out a survey to our membership in the next weeks to ask for your opinions about next steps and to help us assess your level of comfort with different options. And we'd really love to hear from you. Um, if all goes well and things continue to be stable with COVID, we are hoping to have in-person meetings again, potentially in February or March. So please keep an eye out for that survey. We're very eager to hear from you. So it's time to get started. You're not here to listen to me. And I um, will ask you to please uh, mute your microphone and turn off your camera. Thank you in advance. Uh, you can enter questions in the chat. We'll keep, we'll keep track of those um, and have a Q&A session at the end. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our friend Jane Tillman to introduce our speaker, Dr. Cinti Lee. Thank you so much. Jane, over to you. All right, thank you, Nicole. Well, I'm thrilled with our turnout tonight. This is great. You all have come to the right place to learn all about shorebirds of the Texas coast with Dr. Cinti Lee, who is here joining us from Rice University, where in his day job, he's a professor of geology in the Department of Earth, Environmental and Planetary Science and he conducts research and teaches courses on geology, geochemistry, and mineral resources that maybe you could say have nothing to do with birds. But he has been teaching field ornithology at Rice for 15 years. And um, he really enjoys difficult identification or bird identifications. So he likes to tackle things like, hmm, is it a long bill versus a short bill dowager? What kind of peewee is it? What kind of oriole might it be if it's an immature? What kind of loon am I looking at? Pippets, gulls, you name it. Right now he is working on a field guide to the impen nets flycatchers. Doesn't that sound like a chore? <laughs> he has recently embarked on recording uh, nocturnal flight calls too across Rice University, which is pretty cool. And if you'd like to enjoy his um, art. He's an amazing artist and uh, and he has a lot of drawings too. So just Google search Sin T, so it's C-I-N dot hyphen T-Y Lee art, and you can look at his wonderful pictures. So um, we're really excited to have you tonight, Dr. Lee, and we're going to turn it over to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Jane. For the nice introduction and for inviting me, um, we here with uh, oops, where did um, the uh, oh, trying to find my talk all of a sudden it disappeared on. Oh, here it is. Okay, sorry about that. Um, and uh, let me start the slideshow here. Um, okay, so thank you so much for the invitation, the introduction, and uh, really, uh, of course, I wish I could be there physically and get to uh, meet uh, all of you and I know some of you already. Um, yeah, as Jane was saying, I 
uh, often give talks about uh, bird identification, but I think uh, today I decided I'd tone down on the bird identification, would we'll still do a little bit of that, but talk about shorebirds in sort of the broader context um, in terms of their migration, their conservation, a uh, little bit of their life history, and um, and of course, in the context of uh, birding on the Texas uh, coast. Um, so in the background here, this is at Bolivar Flats, uh, Audubon Sanctuary, it's at high tide. And uh, this is in early spring and you can see all of these um, avocets. We get thousands and thousands of avocets there. And I, I sometimes just enjoy just sitting there, standing there, watching them. They're all pointed in the same direction, all in formation. These are sleeping it's because it's high tide. And it's just, to me, something so special to know that when this was in March, that uh, in a couple of weeks, many of these were going to head north back to their breeding grounds. Um, the other thing that I always find fascinating is that these shorebirds, they congregate together in large numbers and mixed species flocks. If you look in this picture, you'll see here's a Dunlin all by itself. Of course, a bunch of laughing gulls. Here's a Sanderling few sanderlings there and they they seem to work well uh, together even though they're all trying to get food from the same uh, mud flats so we'll talk about that uh, in this presentation so what we'll do is i'll start off with um, what are shorebirds where do you find them and uh, why do they migrate uh, and uh, we'll of course touch a little bit on how to get started in identifying shorebirds. Um, and then finally, I'll end with some of the threats to shorebirds and uh, how we should think about shorebird conservation as we move forward. So I'll start off with a, a few images here of some of my favorite shorebirds. This is a ruddy turnstone. And uh, it's, it's about this big, or so about six, seven inches long. Um, it breeds up in the Arctic and actually occurs across the globe. Um, so it's a whole Arctic bird. And then it winters down uh, in equatorial and also down in the Southern hemisphere, but strictly along the coast. Uh, although they do pass through in migration uh, through the interiors of the continent. So where you are, in, um, in the Austin area, uh, these will probably fly through during migration, but they don't stick around in the winter. They go to our coast down here uh, along the Gulf of Mexico, but they're great birds. Um, they have a stubby bill that's slightly upturned. Uh, and what they do is they walk along the shore and they lift uh, little stones or flotsam on the beach, turn them over looking for invertebrates. So they sort of scavenge along the, the beach and they have a really fantastic uh, wing pattern when they fly. Um, part of that uh, contrasting wing pattern, I suspect, is to uh, distract predators as predators of, you know, like peregrine falcons going after them. All these white wing flashes can be quite distracting, but it makes for a very beautiful uh, bird. Another one of my favorites is the American avocet. There are about 400,000 American avocets in the world. Um, avocets actually occur throughout the, the world, um, but the American avocet is endemic to North America. And I would say it's the prettiest of all the avocets around the world. All the other avocets are just black and white. Ours in the uh, summer gets this rusty orange head, um, making it quite a spectacular bird. They breathe up in the great uh, upper uh, plains the high plains and then also in the Great Salt Lake area and the upper basin and range in northern Nevada and southern uh, southeastern Oregon. And then they winter along the coast um, in huge numbers along the Gulf of Mexico. And they, they're sort of the surface feeders. They feed um, at the surface of the water, that long bill is slightly upturned. And instead of probing into the mud, it sweeps it back and forth along the surface of the water trying to catch uh, floating invertebrates, plankton, such as uh, zooplankton, such as shrimp. Um, 
And so whenever it kind of sweeps randomly, whenever it feels something, it catches it and eats it. Uh, it needs long legs so it can wade in uh, the water uh, in search of its prey. And you'll, uh, I, I put world populations in most of my slides just to give you an idea of how many of these birds actually exist. Um, one, another favorite of mine is the Hudsonian godwit. And there's 70,000, uh, which sounds like a lot, but when you think about 70,000, there's, there's 7 billion uh, people on this planet, 70,000 doesn't sound very much. It's, it's much, much smaller than the population of, of Houston, for example. Um, and so this is a, a good sized uh, shorebird. Um, it probably stands about two feet tall, I guess, and long wings, powerful wings. And it needs that because it um, has a, one of the longest distance migration routes of, of all birds. Um, it breeds up local, you know, in Western Alaska, Northern Canada here, uh, also breeds in Hudson Bay around Churchill. And then um, the great majority migrate through Texas right here, East Texas, down the Mid-Continent Flyway, across the Gulf. Some of, the, some of them go around the Gulf and they come all the way down and they winter down here in Southern uh, South America. And then another group goes out, flies out toward, you know, from Massachusetts and Newfoundland and out around the Atlantic Ocean and then down to here. And they need these long wings to make the long journey. And so although there's 70,000, which sounds like a lot, almost all of them go through this part of Texas. So if anything were to happen along this path, um, or in, of course on the breeding grounds or wintering grounds, um, their existence could be threatened. So they can be very common today. They're actually not common. Uh, although if you live in Houston or along the Texas coast, you might think, well, they're, they're not that rare, but uh, um, it doesn't take much to disturb them such that, you know, in a couple, few years, if all the habitat was destroyed, that 70,000 could dwindle pretty quickly. So what are shorebirds? Uh, they're classified under the order Sharadriforms, and Sharadriforms includes, so our typical shorebirds like the sandpipers, the plovers, oyster catcher, but they also include the gulls, the skuas, jaegers, and even the ox. Here's a thickney. Chacanas are part of the Sharadriforms, uh, and this weird bird called the ibis bill that lives out in the in Tibet, in the Himalayas, uh, uh, which is a very unusual bird. So it's a diverse group of birds. And what I've shown here is a paper by Jarvis, where they looked at the, uh, the phylogeny of these birds and when they uh, may have diverged. And the x-axis here is millions of years ago. So here's 10, 20. So you go over to here, this arrow corresponds to about 65 million years ago. And that's the uh, the extinction of the dinosaurs. So you go from the age of the dinosaurs to the age of the mammals and then diversification of birds. So you can look through all these birds here and go in through here and the uh, Shiraja forms here, which are the shorebirds, they appear to uh, split off and diversify there basically shortly after the dinosaurs went extinct. So they're a really old lineage. So these, these are essentially uh, all that we've got left of dinosaurs, they're just in the form of birds now with feathers and, and they fly. Um, but these shorebirds that you see today, they've been in existence on our planet for tens of millions of years. And that's something to keep in mind. So the migrations that have been going on that we go every year to watch twice a year have been going on for tens of millions of years. Um, to, for context, songbirds are up here, these ossines, sub -ossines. They diversified or is there, they started around 30 million years, so much younger. And of course, you know, the warblers, the diversification of warblers, those are much younger down in this range in the last uh, 10 million years or so, or even less. Um, but shorebirds are uh, ancient uh, lineage. And within, uh, this is just because this is being recorded, I'm gonna, I just did this for completeness. Within the Shiragiform orders are all these different 
families of birds, some of that you may be familiar with, uh, some that don't occur in, the, in North America, some you may be less familiar with. But when we think about shorebirds as birders, we typically think about just a group of, uh, of these families, the Scolopacidae, which are the sandpipers, phalaropes, snipes, and then um, Shiradridae, these are the plovers and lapwings, and of course, oyster catchers, avocets, and stilts. So these are the ones that I'm going to talk about when we think about shorebirds. But even within that uh, subset, uh, within the Shiradriform order, um, these shorebirds have just a remarkable uh, diversity, um, far more than, in some sense, the, even the songbirds. Uh, if you were to look at differences in terms of size, uh, shape of bill, length of legs. I mean, if you looked at something like this, a long billed curlew and compared it to a Wilson's plover down here, you'd almost say, well, how could they even be related? It's so, so different. So we have bills that are long and decurved, bills that are long and upturned, short, stout bills, uh, um, medium length, straight bills, uh, and then with all the small peeps, uh, wide range in sizes of these birds. And in Texas, we have uh, over 30 species of shorebirds to, to choose from uh, over the year to, to study uh, from central Texas all the way to the coast. So a lot of diversity out there, even within uh, uh, the state of Texas, even when you're not looking at the whole planet. And the reason, one of the reasons why there's such uh, diversity in the different structures of these birds is, of course, uh, related to um, food availability. And all of these shorebirds, they mo they're essentially, um, they eat invertebrates. And um, so they're designed to basically try to extract invertebrates out of the soil, the mud, um, the grass. And the invertebrates, of course, are trying to get away from these uh, predators, the shorebirds. And so invertebrates themselves, um, they sort of co-adapt, try to find ways to stay away. And so you take a mud flat here, you will have some organisms that will be scavenging on the surface, taking advantage of algae going on, on it, uh, even though they're more prone to being eaten. Um, but the cost benefit of, of plenty of food at the surface uh, beats being eaten, I guess, the chance of being eaten. And then some will eat uh, dead organic matter uh, decomposing within the soil or the, the mud column. And so they, they dig burrows deep down and they try to stay away from the surface uh, where most of the uh, predators are, uh, like the birds. So there's the stratification of prey in, in the in an estuary, there's some in the water, some at the southern water interface, and some deeper down to seven down easily, um, half a meter. And so birds have just uh, evolved such that um, their bills are designed uh, to tap these different sorts of critters. So a godwit with that long bill is designed to tap uh, deep down. Same with the curlew, or the curlew may be going after these lugworms right here with the curve of that those uh, burrows. And then you go all the way to something like a little sandpiper or a plover. They're, they're really designed to their bills to surface feed, pick off the surface of the, um, of the mud. And since they're good at that, they can't get the deep ones. And then the godwits, well, they're not very good at picking things off the surface. So the remarkable thing is um, in, in one given area in a mud flat, there are actually uh, numerous niches for the birds to take advantage of. And the birds can, the different species can coexist, but they're actually not competing because they're um, tapping food from different parts of the ecosystem, even though they're in the same space, uh, spatial area. Um, so here is, a diagram of a uh, tidal mudflat, which also I'm showing you just to give you an example of, of um, where you might find shorebirds and how they could be stratified in here. So mudflats or tidal mudflats, right? We, we get tides twice a day, or though at Bolivar right here, maybe only once a day is sort of controlled by the geometry of the Gulf of Mexico too. 
Um, and we'll come back to the bowl of our flats. There's this jetty here and you drive down here, or park over here and you can walk down uh, over here to see these, um, uh, these mud flats and the estuary behind here. And there's a connection here to this ocean, the seawater, which is salty. And here it would be fresh water. And so there's a transition uh, between salt water and fresh water in terms of salinity. And so it's a highly dynamic environment. The chemistry is changing. The water levels are changing every day, uh, during the day. And um, the organisms, when the tide comes in, they come out and uh, feed. When the tide goes out, they try to rush back in. And then the birds rush out when the tide goes out to catch any of these inverters before they've dug deep down, down too deep for them to be uh, accessed. And uh, anywhere in this estuary you'll have at any given time, there'll be uh, deeper water, shallower water, fresh water up here, salty water here. Um, you have the open seashore, the open, uh, and the dunes here, and um, they're all different niches and they're changing, of course, with time. And the birds, well, to if you want to look for shorebirds, you, um, you kind of have to understand the dynamics of an estuary. Or another way to look at it is once you start to go shorebirding, you start to get closer to your understanding of nature, of how these ecological dynamic ecosystems work. And so birds are sort of a window into this really neat, I call it geology, but it's also ecology and ecological um, system. And so here are some of the pictures of, of birds on the mud flats, uh, Western sandpiper, a world population of three and a half million. You know, down here in the coast, you can get massive flocks, uh, which uh, if a world population of three and a half million spread across the United States, it's not a lot when you think about it, um, but they're tiny little um, denizens and they uh, uh, usually in very shallow water, they don't have very long legs and they pick off the surface and maybe probe uh, into the mud, maybe about a centimeter deep. So that's what they do. And then the avocet, you've already seen them, although my starting photo, they had their heads tucked in, they were sleeping at high tide but now the tide is going out a little bit and now they start to feed. And they often feed together um, as a big group. Uh, it's possible the reason why they do that, although there's competing for food resources, there may be uh, so much food that there really isn't any competition, but by moving together in sort of unison and, and disturbing the water, it gets all the shrimp uh, uh, agitated and, and makes it easier for them to, to eat. Uh, be more successful in capturing prey. So in some sense, they, they, find, they find a way to collaborate and work together. Another surface uh, bird is the snowy plover. And uh, it has a short stubby bill. And so it really can't probe into the mud much, uh, not even as deep as uh, Western sandpiper, which might go a centimeter. These really are picking off the surface. So um, when uh, the tide goes out, uh, they will go off where there's no water, but it's still wet and they'll be looking for little invertebrates that still haven't been made it back into their burrows, you know, been stranded by the tide. And they really are uh, beach face birds and open mud flats. They require uh, sandy beaches for nesting uh, usually. And uh, they're actually the world population. They're endemic to, of course, North America, uh, and they're only 31,000, which is a really small number if you have been paying attention to all the numbers I've been throwing out for the previous shorebirds. And that's because of the very restricted uh, habitats. They don't migrate that much. Um, it's like they don't have the big uh, land mass of the Arctic to breed. They breed essentially along the Texas coast or in California. And uh, so they're potentially threatened uh, as we consume more beaches uh, by destroying them, either by development or, uh, and I'll talk about later, beach erosion that we indir indirectly uh, cause. 31,000, not many. Now, other habitats to pay attention to, and this is not one that we have too much of in along the Gulf Coast because of 
the, the geology actually. But I, I mentioned it um, for completeness is rocky shores. And this is more for the New England area or uh, Pacific coast. Um, but here in Texas, we do get them. They, they're all along all our jetties, they're man-made, but you'll have algae growing on them. You might have some barnacles uh, and other invertebrates crawling around. And so these uh, birds will, will crawl around here uh, foraging for food. Sanderling will sometimes get on this. Here's at least sandpiper doing it, even though it's usually more on the uh, in, on the mud, uh, grassy mud areas. Uh, purple sandpiper, a uh, very rare bird um, in Texas. And this was not photographed in Texas. This one I photographed in Massachusetts. Um, but uh, look at, for them uh, on the rocky jetties. So I show this mainly because these shorebirds can be very specific in terms of the habitat uh, preference. So if you're in uh, central Texas, for example, um, and have a shorebird that's say out of uh, range, it's very possible that where you find it is in a place that somewhat mimics uh, the habitat that it likes, that it prefers. I doubt you'll ever see a purple sandpiper in central Texas uh, because they're so specific to the coast, but you could see a um, uh, number of other shorebirds in, in central Texas. Um, other uh, habitats are open fields and this long-billed curlew, there's only about 50 to 100,000 of these. These are estimates, hard to know exactly how many there are, but uh, you'll find these on open mud flats, but you also find them in grasslands where they will uh, be looking for grasshoppers, or if the, the soil is wet, they may even uh, stick their bills down into the surface, catch crayfish and, and um, other invertebrates. Uh, the upland sandpiper, one that we don't see too many of, um, yet the population is quite a bit larger than long bill curly, 750,000. We don't see so many of them because they get they hide in the grass and it's very hard to, to spot them. But uh, the these are really uh, specific to grasslands. You you almost never find them on mud flats, and if you do, they're there for uh, a split second before they fly off. They just stopped, and checked it out, and took off. So habitat um, is really important when thinking about uh, shorebirds. This is a uh, uh, image uh, I, I painted of. Bolivar Flats. Uh, this is Galveston looking out the way those twin towers in Galveston. And I got a peregrine falcon and a red knot and, and a huge flock of shorebirds taken off. Uh, and, you know, the shorebirds, one of the things when they go out to feed in the open mud flats, there's so much food uh, out there. The, uh, don't, don't do that. Uh, the, there's so much food out there which is great for the shorebirds, but the only problem is they're exposed um, and basically easy to uh, be uh, uh, caught. Oh, can you close the door? The dog is barking. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. And the uh, so they're they're basically like sitting ducks. And so how these shorebirds. Uh, protect themselves, we'll, they really can't protect themselves directly, but what they'll do is uh, they congregate in large numbers and it's sort of, well, if there's plenty of us, um, what are the chances that I will get taken out uh, when there's uh, 10,000 of my peers out there? So as, as long as I fly faster than the others, uh, I'm not the last one, I won't be taken out. So that's one reason it's like safety in numbers. But the other one is when you have all these together feeding together, you got a lot of eyes paying attention to the surroundings. And so uh, uh, they can spot this predator quickly. And I've, you know, when you're out looking at shorebirds, um, the, you often will see these shorebirds take flight very early on and you wonder what's going on. And then, you know, a minute later you see a peregrine falcon coming, coming back. Um, so um, the other thing is this mixed species flock. 
there are some shorebirds that actually uh, have uh, they may stand up taller or they may pay attention more to the environment like yellow legs and black bellied plovers. These, these are um, what we call sentinel birds and they, uh, I, I gotta finish this, okay? Uh, I'm being recorded here. Uh, so they're sentinel birds and they're, they kind of are on the lookout for um, predators. So they sort of benefit from each other here. So these birds, I showed you those range uh, maps there of birds uh, breeding up in the north, wintering down the south or the equatorial regions in the southern hemisphere. And so what that means is they're moving. For half the year, they're moving. They do it twice, two times a year. Uh, they fly north in the spring to the breeding grounds, and then they fly south uh, in the fall. And fall for the shorebirds actually means July, and they continue coming down through um, end of September and into October. And this migration of birds is happening all across the world, not just in the United, uh, North America, but you have a massive one that goes from Eastern Siberia down through Eastern Asia and into Australia, the great Australasian uh, flyway. And then some will go over the Himalayas uh, from Eurasia and down to Southern uh, Africa. Um, and so the why do birds migrate? Um, the, it's of course related to the seasons and, uh, and the seasons are related to the fact that the Earth's orbit is um, tilted with respect to the uh, plane as it goes around uh, the sun. And so in the northern winters, it's cold and, and then uh, in the northern summers, it, it's uh, warm uh, up in the northern hemisphere. And so you might say, well, okay, the birds must move around because it's too cold in the winter up in the north so they go, they go south. Um, but actually, if you recall, these birds, uh, these shorebirds diversified back 65 million years ago. And at that time, the Earth's climate was quite a bit warmer. And uh, maybe it wasn't so cold even in the winter in the Northern Hemisphere. But what is different for sure is that in the Northern Hemisphere, in the winter, there's no sun. And if there's no sun, there are no plants. And, the, and then if there are no plants, there are no insects. If there are no insects, there are no birds. So these birds are moving simply because um, the earth is tilted and has those uh, seasons. Now, you, you could ask, well, why is it? And if you go back here to this migration pathway here, we don't have uh, most shorebirds basically breed up in the Arctic and then winter in the Southern hemisphere or the equator. The reverse does not happen, which is we don't have a lot breeding down here and going north uh, for the winter or, or the Southern winters. And you would think, well, it should just uh, balance out. Well, the problem, the reason why is on our planet, most of the land mass is in the Northern hemisphere. And, and uh, at the high latitudes here where you have daylight you know, 24 hours, um, that's only in the Northern Hemisphere. In the Southern Hemisphere, you have the Antarctica, but it's uh, uh, surrounded by all this water here, which isolates Antarctica from the rest of the ocean and keeps it covered with ice. So Antarctica has been covered with ice for 35 million years, and really nothing can breathe there except the penguins there. And there's just not enough land mass down here for the birds to, to take advantage of that as a breeding range. So that's the reason why it's lopsided. It's everything's biased towards the, the Northern hemisphere. And uh, you can even see this, this is CO2 in the atmosphere versus time measured in over Hawaii. And, uh, and you know, it's been rising of course, related to CO2 emissions. But uh, what I wanted to focus your attention on is this sawtooth pattern. And that's the, that's, that's the, Earth's ecosystem breathing and, and respiring. And um, it would be completely balanced, no sawtooth pattern if the Earth was a bit more balanced up here. But since all the plants are up in the Northern Hemisphere, it breathes 
um, uh, more in the uh, summer and then in the winter it ex exhales basically the CO2. And that's why we see the seasonality in these signals. And the birds are basically uh, following that um, for the last tens of millions of years. So when we look at um, these birds uh, of migrating, I'm going to show you a few more examples of some migratory patterns. This is the whimbrel, and it actually occurs throughout the, the earth, uh, throughout uh, also in the old world. Um, the American whimbrel uh, breeds up here in the tundra um, and then winters along the Gulf of Mexico and all the way down to Tierra del Fuego. And it's very similar to a long-billed curlew, but slightly shorter bill and a striped uh, head uh, appearance. And there are a number of groups, some will migrate down the Pacific, some will migrate down uh, the mid-continent flyway. Um, but these uh, investigators uh, radio tagged um, whimbrels that winter in Northern South America, Brazil, Guyana there, and they wanted to see where these things are going. And these are the paths. And so some of them basically island hop, okay? They breed all the way out here in Northwestern Canada. Um, and, but then some uh, go all the way out over the Atlantic Ocean, Western Atlantic, and they don't stop until they get to their um, wintering grounds. That's an amazing journey to go nonstop over the ocean flying. Uh, this is why they have long, strong uh, wings. But to do that, um, it's very dangerous, uh, very energy intensive. Um, and you think, why do the birds do this? Why would they risk their lives uh, to migrate up here um, when they could die? And of course, it goes back to there's so much energy up here, so much uh, insects and plants that the birds can feed up there. So uh, these shorebirds have figured out that it's uh, much more advantageous to go up there, even though that window of time where there's so much energy up there is only like a month and a half or two. Uh, it's just enough they can go and have a lot of babies and then come down and uh, it offsets the, the risks of dying along the way. Um, in any case, this flight as you go down here is uh, so energy intensive that they stop here before they take off and they build up their, they eat, they build up their fat reserves. So these are the migratory stopovers. They have to stop at the Southern parts of Hudson Bay along the, in Newfoundland here or in Massachusetts, they'll stop, refuel, build up that body fat and then go. And then by the time they get out here and they'll fly nonstop, they won't even sleep uh, and they'll go and they take a couple of days to get out here. And by that time when they're done, they may have lost 30, 40% of their body weight. It's amazing. Imagine if, if you know, humans did that when we did a triathlon, we lost 40% of their body weight. Uh, I don't think we would be alive, but uh, the birds can do it. Um, the upland sandpiper, uh, we saw that 750,000. This is where they occur and they pass through mostly through Texas here. And um, although there's 750,000, I bet uh, when you're out in the field, in any given season, you might only see half a dozen unless you see a big flock. And even those flocks might be only like 20, 30 or so, but probably 80% of those go right through Texas. So it's a good 500,000, half a million are going through Texas twice a year, East Texas. Um, so how do we know they're, they're going when sometimes we don't actually see them on the ground? Uh, when COVID started, Myself and a few others around the country, as well as now uh, a new, a few people, uh, additional people in Texas, like Ron Weeks down in Brazoria, we've started recording the skies, uh, trying to detect what flies over in the night, and um, and we got to see um, you know, these uh, upland sandpipers are flying over every almost every single night, even when it's storming, they're just going, and we. By tracking all of this essentially 24 seven in, in one season, we can get a really, really good picture of the migration window, which would otherwise take um, with just individual observers putting everything together, it might take a decade to, to fully flesh out. And um, 
what hopefully you can hear that this is what this is a flock of uh, upland samplers flying over Rice University um, a couple of falls ago. We don't know exactly how many are up there. There's probably four at least here based on the, the number of calls and the intensity of the calls. Why they call in the night. So they're migrating in the night, so you can't even see them. It's, the, it's called the dark migration. Why they call, nobody really knows, but I'd like to think that they're on this long journey that they can't see. They're navigating with the magnetic field, maybe with the stars, but they can't see each other. So they're calling out to each other, letting each other know that maybe they're okay on this long, long flight going over metropolitan uh, Houston uh, area. And we record them because um, although there's 700,000 of them, uh, we could have said something similar about the Eskimo curlew. Maybe the Eskimo curlew never was 700,000, but at one point there were a lot of Eskimo curlews and then they disappeared. And so we may have a lot, but what if they were to disappear 10 years from now, 50 years from now? Well, we'd want to know what they sound like when they fly over um, and when they fly over. So this is just, I put this together just the last night just to show you all the records, just over two seasons of recordings. And, um, and it gives you a really good picture of when they pass through. In spring, it's a very narrow window. And then in fall, they start coming in um, at the very end of July. And then uh, they continue into the third week of October. Um, and uh, eBird, would, at least on the Texas coast, might highlight uh, as a rarity uh, in early October. Um, but by us recording, we actually see them that, that front continues to push, push through. Um, and we hope to keep doing this uh, every year now. And uh, the idea is to build a network of these microphones uh, along the entire Texas coast if we can get the money to do so. The other, uh, here's a sanderling. This is a common bird. Um, although the world population, believe it or not, is only 650,000 uh, and it occurs all over. Um, Here's one in breeding plumage. Here's one that's moving into breeding plumage. This is in late spring uh, along the coast. And so the birds, they change their plumage. Uh, so there's a winter and there's a breeding plumage. So they're con uh, at different times of the year, they're molting, dropping their feathers, replacing them with new feathers. I show this one because it opened its wings and um, long wings here. And this is in the spring. And this set of wings um, has uh, yet to fly, uh, to make the journey. So it's still relatively fresh. And um, in, in a week, I saw this, it was probably headed up north uh, to go breed on this set of wings. And it'll come back south on the same set of wing feathers um, in the fall. This is in May and it's still in Texas. And so it's gonna go up to the Arctic and it'll spend a, a couple months there, but it'll start heading right back down in July and uh, may even be back in Texas by July. So gone from Texas by only a, a month. And you can see that here, what I call the cycle of the sanderling. Um, this is just at Bolivar and the sanderlings occur throughout the year, but you can see they start coming in uh, at the beginning of July, they, they arrive. And then the numbers build up as more migrants coming through or passing through. And then they stabilize when you hit um, late September, the numbers stabilize, these are wintering birds. And then they continue to stabilize. And then they start to decline. And that's our birds taking off in April and headed north. The males will leave first, followed by the females. And then finally, the stragglers here, which might be first year birds that uh, aren't really sure what to do, so they didn't go up. And then a few lingerers in the summer. But by, by the end of May, most are gone and they're up in the Arctic breeding. And then in June, it's kind of the doldrums down here in the Gulf in Texas and the birds are, uh, they're, they're gone, just a few that linger around. But, uh, and then they come back uh, by July 1, they're pretty much back. And, the males come first, then the females, and then the juveniles. This is this mark right here. It tells you tells you when the first juveniles we detected 
of Sandalin is coming back. So that's um, in the second week of August, they're here. And so the juveniles, they come on their own. They don't actually follow the parents because the males came first, the females then, and the juveniles come on their own. Um, and it's pretty remarkable that these birds, they don't learn their behavior of migration. It's ingrained in their heads. They have a magnetic compass. They have some sort of map in their head too. And they somehow know when they're born, when to go and where to go. And they always arrive at the same date, plus or minus a few days, depending on the weather. But they're like clockwork. Uh, just something I find truly remarkable to see these birds uh, so almost working perfectly. So the standarding is a good one to look at because you see these different plumages. They're so different in the breeding plumage. Uh, so these birds, what they do, the adults, they're on their wintering grounds and they'll look like this on their wintering grounds. White sandering, these are adults. Uh, they molted their, uh, and replaced their uh, worn breeding plumage feathers with these gray colors. And then um, just before they leave, to fly north, they molt into their breeding plumage. And most shorebirds uh, molt before they fly north, although some of the ones down that went way down extreme South America will, will molt along the way north in a kind of protracted molt. But, um, and then they go. So this guy molted, is still in Texas, and it'll soon fly north. Um, they breed, they come back down, and um, as soon as they get down, then they will go through a, a full molt. That's where they actually drop their um, flight feathers and replace them one by one. And they do that only after they reach their wintering grounds. So one set of wings flies up and down. So it's a, a long journey. Those, those feathers have to last two journeys, which is remarkable. Now this is a juvenile. And the juveniles look really different, really scaly back. A lot of shorebirds, juveniles, have this very immaculate sort of uh, uh, appearance, um, delicate appearance, very beautiful. They all look like, you know, scaly backed uh, appearance. And this is in its first year. We had this this fall in August in uh, Brazoria County. And, uh, and once they get here, they will quickly transition to these white ones here uh, by October. Uh, or late September, they'll look like this. And so you can just watch them make this transition. But one thing to note, you see the long wingtips here, and they're a bit longer than the adults. And these juveniles of all shorebirds tend to have slightly longer wings than the adults. And presumably that's because the juveniles are less experienced, even though they, they know where to go and how to go, uh, they still have to um, adapt to the winds and so forth the weather, and so they're given uh, slightly longer wings to deal with that, their first maiden journey. And then they become like the adults. They'll drop these feathers and they'll get new feathers that are more adult-like. Um, and that's important to know because, you know, when you're looking at shorebirds and looking for rarities, often like some, sometimes the, the rarities are the juveniles, they get lost a little more often than the adults. And, um, long wingtips are often used as a field mark, but you got to be careful that juveniles always have proportionally longer wingtips than adults, so keep that in mind. Uh, here, more of the sandalings um, flying and here. Um, here's some pictures of birds undergoing molt after they arrived in on the wintering grounds. You can see a, a long-billed curlew. Uh, it's got brand new inner primaries. And then these are the old primaries, uh, outer primaries that have had to weather two migration journeys and see how afraid they are. And it's got to replace those and it's in the process of replacing them. And so when it doesn't have to fly much, it's on the wintering grounds on the mud flats, now is the time to change the feathers. The same thing goes with here. This is one where you can see it dropped the feathers uh, with the inner primaries, and then new ones are coming out, but it's not complete, and but it can still fly a little bit. This is a short-billed uh, dowager. So we can often tell by whether the bird is molting, whether it's going to stay, or whether it's still continuing south to South America. And 
as I mentioned, you know, migration is such a wonderful thing. The birds are, are almost perfect in their ability to know where to go, when to go, and so forth. But there's always a small fraction that get lost. And they become vagrants, and we get excited when we get a bird from Asia. And in Eurasia, they get excited when they see an American bird. It's all about location, location, location. But uh, I put this up, you know, always be out on the lookout for unusual birds. And this is a curlew sandpiper that I found in uh, 2006. I've been searching ever again for one. I still haven't found another one. So this might be the only one I'll ever see in Texas. But uh, it was in June, by the way. And uh, June is a time when you think it's not worth going out looking for birds. But uh, if you look carefully at a lot of these Eurasian vagrants of shorebirds, in Texas, many of them were found in June. Uh, the bowl of all boulevard records um, of uh, curlew sandpiper have been in June or May, late May. And, uh, and these are, it's still winter plumage. So these are first year birds that did not um, transition into breeding plumage and just got stuck here um, along the coast. They didn't keep on flying. Maybe they're sick, who knows, but this should be down in Australia, but instead it's, it was in Texas. In central Texas, I think you guys have had spotted red shank in the spring, which is spectacular. Okay, so um, I'm gonna transition to a, just a tiny bit on uh, bird identification. Um, how do I get started doing shore burning? There's so many of them. They kind of all look the same in the sense that they're all kind of brownish in color. This is what I often get asked. And here we are with the shorebird class actually at Bolivar that I was doing for, I think Houston odd one. I can't remember which one, but, um, and, and, uh, and I tend not to worry about all the fine details of um, the field marks, uh, really more about looking at the holistic picture and getting an impression of the birds, uh, which is the best way because shorebirds are usually far away and they're moving and the lighting conditions aren't always the greatest. So shape, body size, these are all important. You want to look at their relative proportions, uh, length of bill, and uh, shape of bill, size. That'll pretty much be 50% of the, the challenge. You can tell, is it a godwit or is it a plover, right? So um, always focus on that first. And uh, even the experts focus on that. Once you get um, to those course differences, then you can focus in a little bit on more of the subtleties. And uh, here are uh, smaller sandpipers that kind of all look the same, but they're different sizes. So you just gotta calibrate your eyes to a common shorebird and then uh, look at all these other shorebirds in the context or relationship to one of the ones that you're familiar with. And they also have uh, slightly different length legs, right, stilt, curlew, sandpiper, Dunlin, western sandpiper. Some stand tall, some are closer to the ground, and, and so forth. And those differences in bill length and leg length also uh, dictate where the shorebirds may be feeding. So here are three of the peeps that often are a source of confusion, especially when they're far away, at least semi-palmy western. Um, there's a tendency that when you're out in a mud flat, that the westerns are a little bit out in the water, like a couple, like an inch deep of water. And then the semi palmated uh, might be a little bit shallower water. And the least might actually be on the mud itself or at the edge of the water, um, all a function of the different lengths and where they like to feed based on the different length bills and, and legs. So I use, shape, body size, all of that, and then subtle differences in where these birds are walking around to help me find shorebirds and identify shorebirds. Here's an example, Dunlin versus Western Sandpiper, which uh, in this case, they're easy because this one's in breeding plumage and this one's in winter plumage. But uh, uh, if you don't have them side by side and they're both in winter plumage, the Dunlin actually can look very much like a Western. Uh, if you can't judge size, which sometimes is the case, you don't have a marker to judge. Um, but when they're next to each other, look at the size difference. And also the bill proportionally is much longer on a Dunland than on a Western um, 
except for the longest build westerns, which might overlap with the shortest build uh, dunlins. But uh, you can see the, the subtle differences in here, size, shape, and so forth. And that's one, if you want to go to the next level from you know, identifying Curlew versus Godwit and Sandpipers, but uh, this might be the next level of difficulty, learn to separate Dunlin from Western, because these are both common. And that'll get you sort of 85% of the way towards knowing your shorebirds. Um, and lesser and greater yellow legs, another one that uh, when they're side by side, not a big deal. Uh, the lesser yellow legs are small, the greater yellow legs are, are big, but uh, when they're by themselves, it can be tough. And so uh, greater has a slightly longer bill, lesser, shorter bill, straighter bill, and a slightly upturned bill. And those, those are sort of the features um, that I use. Here's uh, the world population of greater and lesser yellow legs. Not that many greater yellow legs, actually. And then if you want to take it to the next level, um, you start to look at subtle structural differences between shorebirds. And this would be, for example, separating Western from semi-palmated sandpiper could be very difficult um, if you don't have a, a breeding plumage Western. Uh, and of course, if you're looking for stints, rufous neck stints, little stints, so forth, then you really start to have to look at these subtle things and how do you pick one out from say a thousand shorebirds? Well, what I do is I look at the shapes of the birds and um, for semi palmated Western, there are many ways to look at this. This is just one example. Um, the Western has a little dip here. It's like if you're going off a roller coaster and have this dip, your, your stomach, stomach will lurch. And here it's a little bit uh, easier on your stomach there. So um, like that, it has a little, dip at the western sandpiper and so here you can see that the western see this has this more pronounced dip or tapered rear and the uh, semi-palmated has a straighter uh, back uh, there western also may have slightly longer legs longer bill here's a shorter more conical bill for the semi-palmated um, and then here's least sandpiper which i didn't show a silhouette of but also relatively straight back. Um, it has yellow legs, but uh, often you can't see that, but the legs are short and, it's, and they bend them and they almost are more like mice crawl, scurrying or crawling close with their bellies close to the ground. Whereas Westerns and, and uh, semi palmy stand up a little, uh, a little bit taller. Um, so I could give another talk on shorebird identification, but this is just a teaser of you know, some of the ways to look at uh, uh, shorebirds for identification, but we won't continue on that as that's for a different uh, talk. I want to end now with more uh, about, you know, what's the future? What, uh, uh, how, what lies ahead and conservation of shorebirds? What are the threats to shorebirds? And uh, these are some of the obvious ones. There, there's, uh, of course, cats, um, uh, feral cats uh, down along the coast, uh, particularly for, we do have some shorebirds that nest like Wilson's plover, uh, snowy plover, and uh, willets or the eastern willet. And these can be a menace uh, the, the cats um, to shorebirds and of course, a lot of the seabirds, um, but also pollution, uh, just the litter along the beach uh, damaging nesting sites or foraging sites. Um, and, um, and hopefully the birds don't eat some of this trash. And the, but probably one of the worst is um, in, in the summer, or actually also in the winter, we have a lot of, uh, you know, half of Texas seems to be down along the beach driving up and down uh, the coast. Of course, it's really nice to be able to drive, but there's so many, and I, you know, this summer I was out there no place for shorebirds to hang out along um, any of the public beaches. Absolutely no place. Only in a place like Bolivar, which is a tiny, tiny fraction of the Bolivar Peninsula, where the birds are actually safe from being run over. Um, but it's not just along the coast um, of Texas, where they, you know, they're threatened on the coast of California, the beaches here by just our human presence, but it's everywhere. 
this is just a nighttime view um, uh, collage uh, and the lights here just showing you where we live. And uh, this is what the birds, you know, they migrate a lot of them in the night. And this is what they're seeing. And this used to be theirs, the shorebirds. They didn't have to share it with humans. And now we've taken over with cities, pavement, farmland. Um, and uh, it's, although the birds may breed many of them up here, sounds good. They have to pass through and they have to stop here to rest. So we've, we've, uh, uh, there are issues or challenges with the coastal wetlands and there are challenges with the wetlands in the interior parts of the, uh, of the continents that they need to stop over in. And if you look at the various migration pathways, uh, look, the biggest migration pathway is going through the, the biggest population in North America, right? This whole Eastern seaboard. And of course, the Australasian pathway goes through East Asia. So we are now, whether we like it or not, directly in the face of shorebirds. And they've been doing this for 50 million years or more. And we've only been here for a short time. So the, the biggest uh, impact to, to shorebirds is really the biodiversity loss is really habitat loss that I, uh, or damage to the habitat that I described. And, um, and here's one example of damage within the interior. Uh, so they breathe up here in these grasslands, but the green right here, these are where we're, we've turned everything to farmland. Um, and so that's, that's taken away some of the original uh, prairie habitat where these uh, birds are used to, to breed. So although there are several hundred thousand upland sandpipers, uh, the farming practices may not always be conducive to their, to their survival. So how can we change our ways of farming? We have to farm to support 7 billion people, but how do we do it in a way that works well with the birds? Another one that may be less appreciated is uh, here's um, High Islands is over here. This is Louisiana. This is McFadden National Wildlife Refuge Sea Rim. So uh, Sabine Woods is over here, and there uh, this Highway 87. If you, some of you may remember. I mean, when I got here 20 years ago, I, I think it was already mostly destroyed. But this this highway actually continued, you could drive all the way to Seaburn. Now you need a four-wheel drive uh, to do that. But if you go down towards uh, Bolivar from Highland, you'll now see that even here, this highway, does, uh, its, its days are limited. So this is the old Highway 87 and basically beach erosion has taken this away. And to fight that, what we've been doing down here is we build uh, berms or barriers or dikes. That's great for us to drive but uh, the beach continues to erode uh, and it gets stuck up against the dike that has been built here or these embankments, leaving no beach anymore. If you drive down here, there's almost no beach left. So there's no place for the birds. And one of the reasons why there's no beach left is that there's no sediment being replenished here because we've channelized, diked up uh, a lot of our rivers. So the sediment goes, is transported way out here or caught, back up stream in, in dams. So, um, and so our beaches are, are all receding. Uh, even without sea level rise, they will recede because they're not being replenished by the sediments, uh, the deposition there. And so that's, that's something that's a, a threat to our shorebird uh, wintering or stopover sites. Now there is some hope and Houston Audubon, for example, is, is a good example of where there, there's hope here. Um, and uh, this is from 1954, aerial photos. I don't have a complete image, but this is the jetty it was built in the 18, late 1800s. And this is the late 1800s shoreline right here, this white line. And then um, once that was built, it actually, although not a lot of sediment is coming out, it does capture what little sediment there is here, captures it so it doesn't go into the ship channel, which was the goal of the jetty, and it deposits here. And so we actually are building um, beach and estuary land here. So this green line marks in 1954, the new land 
that that was developed uh, that was formed in as an indirect consequence of building this jetty. And I'm going to move forward in time: 1969, 1995, uh, 2010, um, and 2018. And what you'll see is Bolivar Flats is changing. It's really dynamic, changing. First, we got now all this salt marsh. And uh, actually, if you go back to 2010, you'll see that the salt marsh was made of Spartina grass. Here's your estuary. There was connection of, of water back into here. So making this a great shoreboarding spot. Well, by 2018, it's almost cut off here. And um, by 2020, it's pretty much cut off. There's still water that goes back here. but the, the, the morphology of these mudflats has fundamentally uh, changed. I don't know if that's uh, been, uh, become a better thing or uh, made it worse, but at least we know all of this that has built up has provided a safe haven for shorebirds. But if I were to zoom out and show you the whole uh, upper Texas coast, um, you'll see how much we have destroyed. And while this is a great thing that we have Houston Audubon's estuary here, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of what used to be available as we, you, know, you were to drive up north. So what we need to do is more of that. We've got to worry you know, with the new Ike Dyke that's going to be built. What are the consequences to uh, uh, what little left, even though it's uh, human made, of shorebird habitat that we have? And so this is just showing you uh, the shoreline growing from the late 1800s to 2021 and how, how it changed. So I mentioned all this because of course, we're all in Texas and uh, this should be our state bird, I think it should be the Eskimo curlew. Um, and uh, it, it was up here, bred in the same place with the Hudsonian godwits, wintered in the same place as Hudsonian godwits and migrated to the same place as Hudsonian godwits. And they probably were in the numbers of tens of thousands at their height, uh, a peak. Then one day they were gone. Um, the last one photographed 1962, and ever since, you know, been a few reported sightings in Massachusetts, but nothing ever confirmed. And they disappeared before we ever got to record what an Eskimo curlew sounds like. We don't know what they sound like, so even if they were to fly over, we wouldn't know. And so that's partly why I record the birds flying over the night, because I don't know when they might go. And we need to know what they sound like. So we don't want this to happen to the Eskimo curlew. Uh, what happened to the Eskimo curlew to happen to other shorebirds, even though some of them look pretty good in numbers, but habitat is always being threatened. And these, these guys probably went the way of the dinosaurs because of habitat destruction and hunting at the time. So I, I leave you with that, with this parting shot of Western sandpipers uh, flying away and just go out and enjoy the shorebirds. And thank you for listening to my presentation. Well, thank you. That was wonderful. Sobering, but wonderful. <laughs> um, so I, there are a couple of questions for you. And one of them is more of a comment, but it says, it, some of these shorebirds nest in broad inland areas. Are they nesting or living along lakes and rivers? Also, they may winter along seawaters. Do they have different habitats in different seasons? Oh, yeah, I, I guess uh, you, you saw my bias, uh, which is I'm down here in Texas and not up in the Arctic. But yeah, um, in the, in the, um, on the Arctic nesting grounds, some of them nest uh, uh, essentially very far away from water. Maybe even in the, some of them, even in the mountains, like the rock sandpiper, um, and they uh, they will feed in the wet areas, the bogs, but uh, very different habitat. Interesting enough, than, than their wintering grounds. <clears throat> and another question: um, Which shorebird has the longest migration? Oh. Um, uh, Longest non-stop migration. Well, um, so in in North America, um, Hudsonian godwit has a long migration. Uh, I showed that they go from the Arctic 
circle all the way down to uh, southern or Argentina, southern Argentina. Uh, but the Sanderling also, the Sanderlings, some of them have short migration. They go just from the Arctic down to the uh, Gulf of Mexico or California, Southern California. And some of them go all the way down to Tierra del Fuego, which is for a little guy, quite remarkable. That is. Um, but the other, the longest flights, though, where they don't stop, I showed you some with Wimbrose, but uh, there's some like the bristle thighed curlew uh, that breeds in Western Alaska and it winters in Hawaii or in some of the South Pacific islands and it just flies and it doesn't stop, it just keeps on going. The bar-tailed godwits also in Western Alaska, Eastern Siberia, it, it can go across the Pacific Ocean and go all the nonstop, that's probably the longest, nonstop all the way down to Australia, Southern Australia. I think if you Google Bartel Godwit, you can see the radio tracking. It's pretty spectacular what, uh, what they go through. Um, so I think the old world shorebirds, because of the geology actually, the configuration of cons, they, they have the longest nonstop migratory path shorebirds. Um, okay. American Golden Plover is a contender too. Fascinating. Well, and then I guess we might close with this question. What are some of your favorite birds? Well, uh, I, I like all, all birds, of course, even rock pigeons and house sparrows. In fact, I'm missing the house sparrows, uh, either that rice is being uh, plundered by a Cooper's hog. So uh -huh. I'd, I'd love to see even the house sparrows come back. But um, no, I like them all, but I certainly um, feel I really like shorebirds. Uh, deep connections, not just identifying, but really just like being out and watching them come in, and, um, knowing that they've just gone on a transcontinental flight uh, is kind of humbling to me. So I like that. I like um, warblers and flycatchers, every, every bird, hawks too. So I don't think there's one I don't like. Perhaps my trigger bird or the one that got me into birding was a uh, summer tanager. That's what you're at, uh, hinting at when I was a kid. Uh, here, I grew up in California. So when I saw that summer tanager, I thought, how can that be? Most, most of the Western birds are kind of dull. Uh -huh. how, can, how can there be a bird that's so red? <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice. Well, we really do thank you for your time. And for all this information, I had never heard the term dark migration before. I mean, just that was, that's, that. I mean, I know they migrate it in night, but I've never heard it called dark migration. So that was cool. But all those numbers that you gave us were just like so small. I didn't realize there's so few least sandpipers, for example, because yeah. we see so, you know, so our, our, perceptions are skewed. But anyway, we thank you very much. Nicole, did you want to say anything? Oh, just say, to say thank you. And thanks to everybody for being here tonight. It's great to see everyone. And um, we hope to see you at our holiday gathering and have hope everyone has a happy Thanksgiving. All right. Thanks. Thank you Good so night. much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Bye-bye.